I ask you for your questions about event sourcing and CQRS. And then I took those questions and I brought them to Greg Young for answers. Hey everybody, it's Derek Hobarton from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design and topics like this. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. Okay, so the first one is, you've mentioned, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was specifically about CQRS, that you don't need a framework. That really, I don't know, I think that was specifically about CQRS, I don't think it was necessarily about event sourcing per se, but I think that was kind of the, the gist of it. Yeah. Okay, so just to, I want you to clarify it, why you think that. I have my own perception of why I think people are confused by this. Maybe not confused is the right word. Maybe it's that um, I think just as developers, there's a tendency to want to write a library for everything or a framework for everything is a little bit of it. Um, but why did you say that? And where do you think the confusion is of why people think there needs to be a framework? Okay, so th this one's actually really, really easy for me. Um, I've seen many CQRS frameworks be built over the years. And where it normally starts off is we have a team, and that team is doing some stuff, let's say, over HTTP and C Sharp. And where they start off is they start off using, I don't know, how about an HTTP listener? And then they build up some basic routing on top of that, and push it up one level, and then they have it so it can bring up their nice little modeled things associated to commands. Cool. That's valuable. But... Then 30 days goes by, and then they say, well, you know what? We also need security in this. And, oh, cool, cool. So they, they go and add some security to it. And they say, well, we need some logging in this too. So they go and add logging to it. Another 30 days goes by, and they decide they want to switch from uh, like log for net to another logging framework. And they're like, oh, man, we should support both of them. That way you can have plugins. <laughs> and... This continues for, let's say, a year or two. And then all of a sudden they look at what they have and they go, you know what, we should, we should make this into a framework. Then everybody else can use it. And obviously we'll benefit from this because then we will gain from the work they do on it onto our project. Except now four other projects do this. And the next thing you know, you have 217 different extension points in there. And nobody knows what any of them actually do. Yeah. And I think a little bit of the misconception there probably is like that other people will use it. Yes. And if you are now coming into this as somebody who's never used it before, this is no longer, oh man, this is really cool. I can just like copy and paste this code, get it set up, and I'm up and running in like 30 minutes, dog. This is awesome. Now it's, shit, I need to read this 500-page book about this thing? Yeah. <laughs> if there is, yeah. <laughs> if there is, right? <laughs> you're lucky if you have documentation. Yeah, exactly, at that point. Yeah. A few examples, you're doing pretty well. So I think the other thing there too is I think some of the potential confusion with it from my point of view is, is which has always been is just the, the, con, the conflating of CQRS with event sourcing. And I think that's where I think a little bit of that, well, you don't need a framework or why wouldn't you want a framework um, when they're thinking of the two together potentially and then they're thinking about projections and then all kind of these things together. And then yep. it... I think then the story maybe is a little bit more compelling for people. Um, but I think potentially that is also a reason. It's just conflating different ideas together. Yeah. And like a, a place where you definitely probably want to even look at code that you're going to reuse would be something like projections. Yeah. I mean, that's a non-trivial thing just to go right one day. I'm going to handle batching and I'm going to handle all this cool stuff, prioritization between the different read models that I have inside the same database. And I'm going to do it all. 
Well, you know what? That's pretty much standardized from project to project. And you can probably write a library for that and yeah. reuse it. Just be very, very careful about what you're taking a dependency on. And just as a note for people who might be listening, if you run a project like this, make sure to put out stable versions before making large changes. So that way I don't have to opt in to those changes. And ideally, back patch to those stable versions if you find bugs. So this, this question is probably the, one of the most popular ones. You see the value in event sourcing. You think it makes sense within your context in a legacy system. Um, how, do you <laughs> how do you go incorporating something like event sourcing oh, to an existing boy. system? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And it's in a legacy system. Yeah, something um, existing. So, so what we're going to do here is known as extract service. You you aren't going to go into that legacy system, big ball of mud, and slowly drop it in in just the right precise place and and make all the dependencies beautiful and not break anything. That's just not going to happen. Extract service. That way, you're you're explicit about where your boundaries are. You're showing the interaction that's happening. And if nothing else, you at least now have clear separation. And you can understand what's happening where. Does that kind of make sense? I think it does, yeah. I think it's, I always say like boundaries are probably the, to me, this is just my opinion. I think they're one of the most important things to do. I think they're hard to get air quotes right because right kind of changes depending on what, what you're thinking of when. Um, ah, bah, you probably have your bathroom tiled in hexagons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, that makes sense. Because yeah, like it, I, if you're at the point where um, yeah. if you if you have established boundaries, some logical boundaries within a system, even like a legacy code base, um, making that transition is obviously going to be, I would think, if you if you want to get into event sourcing, we were talking about this prior probably to what I'm recording here, but then using events as a means of communication in the sense of EDA. And yep. I feel like if I'm I'm assuming here that anybody that's using a, that has a legacy system and you're you're thinking, hey, how do I get an event sourcing involved? I'm gonna assume you're not using events in the sense of like EDA for notifications, which then if you are, like you're saying, the first kind of step there is one, defining boundaries. What do you think is the step for people then to kind of get in the the mode of? Well, what we're going to do after that, once we, once we are like finding our boundaries, then we're going to do what's known as strangling. We're going to strangle out this one little piece, pull it out as it is. So even if we're talking like an old mainframe, we're going to pull that out of the mainframe code and make mainframe code talk to the other mainframe code somehow. So now we have just that one little piece of mainframe code sitting over here. And then basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace that. Basically we're putting in the contract here first, and then we're gonna replace everything behind that contract. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think I, think I was kind of, putting the two together immediately what, when you first brought it up, defining the boundaries, absolutely. Um, my biggest thing from there though is what's the, uh, the light switch for people to realize, okay, internally now within that service, that boundary, that I'm now gonna be recording meaningful business events versus- well, this, this, this is a small problem now. Now we might be talking about 10 use cases. We're not talking about 2,000 use cases. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And you know what? Even if we screw up at this point, we've added value by extracting that service. Yeah. But now we have this service that we can start working on and experimenting with without having to affect everything else. It's our safe place. Yeah. It, it, that, that's a good way of defining it. Yeah, of explaining it. Yeah. And it does take some time to get to this point, but now this is out here. And we can show things in that that our business people will actually be able to understand.
it's no longer we're talking about this thing in an abstract sense. And no, 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 we, we, we took that thing that was in there that you know, it's now over here and we've redone it. Let's go take a look at it. And we can, we can even more than this, let's say that we tried out event sourcing over here and they didn't actually like it. Let's try something else. Yeah. Like there's value just in doing this without actually having a goal associated to doing it. Yeah, I think just the, yeah, the, the fact of defining that boundary, separating it out, um, and then, yeah, doing what you will with it at that point. Even if you have a huge system, even only pulling out a few of these is actually valuable. This was this is kind of another common question, which is again, just like purely based on your experience, like where what are the kind of the domains, use cases that clearly make sense to you? But what are the some what are the ones that like maybe this is old hat for you now, but like maybe even early on you're like, oh yeah, like somebody implement here or you saw it, and then you're like, wow, actually, like I didn't inherently think about it, but that makes a ton of sense. Oh boy, there's been a lot of these. I think one of the best was probably dealing with uh, financial stuff. And when you haven't worked in finance and you look at how some of the things occur in finance, you're like, what room of 28 people who all disagreed with each other came up with this process? Like, what the hell was wrong with them? <laughs> this is the most convoluted thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Until you start getting more into what's actually happening. And then you start realizing that, well, yes, there is this giant convoluted process, but then there are also five simplified paths which are done through the process, which are actually modeled as other processes. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So here's our settlement process. Of course, at the beginning of doing a settlement, almost none of them go through this. They get picked through one of these other five processes. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. So you need to understand this complex one, but you only need to under, understand the complex one for one to 2% of transactions. That's it, yeah, okay. So that's what I thought you were getting at. It's like, it's kind of that 80-20 Pareto where, yeah, the vast majority of use cases, right, are going through this one and we can model it potentially that way. Well, and we we have, we've modeled a much simpler process for them to go through. And that's actually part of this process is going, oh, you don't need my process. You can go to that process. Gotcha, yeah. So this question as well is super common. Um, so typically when people are thinking about say wanting to append some new event, kind of the process typically is you're going to the stream, you're pulling out those events, you're replaying them internally, let's say within an aggregate to build up some internal projection that you're going to be basically using to validate any operation that you want to perform on it. Yep. That's right. Whatever I'm being pulled to do. Correct. Right. And then. Assuming that's all good, we'll append another, that event, concurrency, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, but the question always is, is there anything inherently wrong with not using this like that state that I'm building up, but using actually some existing projection? Okay. Meaning, like, so... I guess another way for people, I think you know what I'm talking about, but like, my way of explaining this would be like using a query in your command. You, you can do this, but now we run into a problem. And there are some cases where you have to do it, and I'll get into one of those in a minute. So the entire problem is that my read model is eventually consistent under anything vaguely similar to normal circumstances. It's going to be eventually consistent. So when I go to read from my read model, is what I'm getting out what now is? Or is it what it was three seconds ago or 19 seconds ago or 19 minutes ago? And I can do this and I can go, you know what? Screw it. We'll just use whatever it is. <laughs> no, it's perfectly valid as an option. I just have to write down then when I, when I go to write that event, what was the version of the, of the thing that I was using when I did that? Later on, I can figure out if, well, I might not have 
done that if I knew more at the time. So are you really saying that the version of your stream should be in comparison to the version on that read model? Is that what you're alluding to? Oh, no. What I mean is that I can just read from the read model directly into my domain model. I cannot care at all about where that read model is um, in terms of it being caught up with the events. Because I have a version number on that object that comes over to me telling me roughly where it is by its understanding of it. Yeah, okay. I then write out my events, and I include that version of the read model. And then later, when that read model gets it, it can go, oh, man, you wrote that event. You really shouldn't have done that. I see. Okay. Because it understands what's happened in those events in the middle. Does that kind of make sense? Yep. Yep. So what it, you said you had, like, what's an, ex do you have an example, like a, a use case of this? Um, a common one that you can get into is when you start distributing read models. Or you're dealing with occasionally connected systems. So, okay. So I'm hang, going, hang on a second. Did you do a talk about this where the title was hilarious, where it was like the lettering of Something about like eventual consistency. I'm, it, I'm trying to remember what the lettering was. But if that's related talk. to this, I'll definitely include a link to that talk somewhere because yes, I think that it is a good absolutely idea. related to it. the The thing is, when I'm in an eventually consistent, an eventually consistent environment, like an occasionally connected system, I have to be able to write. So I'm on my little device. I'm at the very bottom of the oil rig. There is no Wi-Fi coverage here. And I'm saying, I checked this meter, and this is what the value on this meter says, and I'm clearing it for safety protocol. Okay, what else has happened on this oil rig while I'm doing that? I have no idea. I go walking back upstairs, five minutes goes by. I come back, and now I'm going to synchronize. What happens to that event? Could there be things that I didn't see? Like, by the way, do not check that particular machine because uh, we're doing maintenance on it right now. It will give you bad results. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that, so I'll definitely, I think you allude way more to how to handle that um, in that talk. So I'll definitely include the link because I, I do remember this because we're talking about this is uh, the other question always is related to eventual consistency. How would you, how would you cl like clarify or classify it? to people is because most people think of it's a really difficult thing to deal with. Um, but I'm not sure if it's difficult or just different. Than... No, no, no. It's neither. Um, you, you need to make a distinction when you talk about eventual consistency. So there's multiple types of eventual consistency. Which type of eventual consistency is very, very important to what we're talking about. So the eventual consistency that most people are using when they use event sourcing and they have a read model is what's known as linearized eventual consistency. We are representing the same linearized timeline. That timeline comes forward and it is immutable. The only question is where you are in the timeline and where I am on the timeline. This is drastically different than interacting with something like, let's say, REOC where you can have nodes that have different ideas of what the timeline even is associated to something. Don't get me wrong, they will converge over time. But any given point in time, you can actually end up with two completely distinct paths that are going on that have no knowledge of each other. With linearized eventual consistency, we know exactly what's happening. We're just not necessarily up till now. People are used to dealing with it as you're mentioning, but like they're used to dealing with even outside of event sourcing, but they may not necessarily realize it sometimes or that it's, it's the same thing. If like, for example, we're talking about like a projection is that my example, I give people all the time is like, okay, you're using a relational database that has a read replica that log ships and it's consistent eventually <laughs> by, well, yeah, uh, by a projection, is, milliseconds. A projection is actually a really, really good example of this. Because with a projection, you might get event A, and then you might not get event B for 10 seconds, even though it was done just now. Yep. But you will never get event B before event A. 
So it's eventually consistent in that it's not that when B happened, it also happened immediately for the projection. There, there, it could be some period of time that exists there, but it is consistent in that it's still linearized here and that you're, you'll still receive the things in order that w of which they occurred. Yeah. And don't be wrong, you can drop that for varying reasons. And sometimes you might even want to, but that's like the default model that you tend to use. If, if the mode you've always been in, let's say we're talking about a legacy system or something, whatever the case may be, say you're just used to being able to read your own write and now you're not. That being unfamiliar of what to do in oh, all no, 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 you, you, you can always read your own write. I was going to get to that. <laughs> but generally, if you're thinking of, okay, well, I make some change, I pen some event, and then I'm expecting via my UI that's going somewhere else that then is expecting to have some separate read model and that thing's eventually consistent. Oh no, like what do I do now? Um, well, and I, I've, I've said, I believe already on this call, uh, the first thing that you do is you don't show them the same data. Send them anywhere else in your UI and make them click on something to come back. 99% of the time, they're not gonna click on the thing to come back to view the thing they just changed. Why? because they already finished it. Yeah. It's like if I'm saying like, I wanna enter a new work item. Okay, here's all the information in my new work item. Create new work item. I really don't want you to show me that work item that's been created because, well, I just told you to do that. I gave you all the data. I already know what all of this is. Send me anywhere else in the system. Yeah, I think too, the piece of the puzzle here is the individual user's perspective. Yep. Right, like well, if I do something right now, and the say you go to some UI that's based on a projection, it's like, okay, and then you didn't get, you don't see that change that I made? Like, are you any the wiser? Well, no, and we can do some tricks like this. So like when I go to create that work item and I get back its ID, and then I, I am going to show you your like assigned work items because I know it was assigned to you. I can just add that one ID in there and be like, it's gonna happen anyway. Yeah. I got back this set that wasn't in there yet, so I'm just going to add this one in at the bottom. It's going to show up anyway. And by the way, I'm only doing it for you. Nobody else is going to see this. Yeah. Have you done anything where you converged, say, the you're suspecting to go to some projection? Um, you know that if, let's say, it's some other record that's going to be there isn't there, then you actually go to to the event stream? Um, so th there's a very easy way of doing this. So when projections, they generally work off the log as a whole. So every event has a position within that log. So what you do is you return the position within that log to the client when they go to do the write. So now when they go to do the read, they include that position on the log and the projection can say whether or not it's gotten there and how far it may be away from being yeah, there. Yeah, that makes sense. And this is the key because it's like, um, are, are you going to tell me to retry after three seconds or are you going to tell me to retry after 30? Or are you going to tell me to retry after I have no idea how long because I haven't moved forward in the log in the last five minutes? Yeah. So that actually kind of brings up kind of my last one, which... I mean, you have your ebook on this, so I'll also link to that because this answers a lot of the questions here, but um, is, is versioning. We had some assumption of what the event was, maybe how we named it or what was included in it. And we realized now that that was horrific. <laughs> we, we, we regret it. <laughs> Uh, it was a terrible, like, let's just say it's something like related to a name. Like, it's just, it's. Well, obviously, as you mentioned that I have a book on this, you're not going to get a 30 second answer out of me on yeah. this. Most of the situations are pretty trivial. So most of the situations can be handled with one of two strategies. It's either we are going to use forward compatibility. So you can add things, you can remove things but you can't rename things. This allows me when I'm looking at this event over time to say this is the same thing over time. 
Oh, look, you added some stuff. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that thing doesn't exist anymore. I understand what that means. This works reasonably well in a lot of situations. And it's simple. But there are other ways of dealing with things that can become more fun. What happens when you do actually have transformations that need to occur? Well, then we can no longer just do this very simple strategy, and we need to start doing a per stream strategy. Um, the quintessential example for this more difficult type of versioning is we have conference call connected and started. And that later becomes conference call connected and conference call started. And there's two distinct events for it. And those two distinct events do not necessarily happen at the same point in time anymore. Uh, you can imagine that they introduced a waiting room before a conference call. These get to be a little bit more interesting in terms of how to break them apart and version them over time. It's breaking it apart, but it's like they're two distinct concepts now. Um, yes. And do I want to keep them as one in my entire history? Or do I want to replay my entire history to make them two concepts historically? Normally, when we do this, uh, we will not do it a stream at a time. We'll do it the entire store at a time. So it's basically you write a transformation from this event store to this event store. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to go through the entire event store, event by event by event by event, keeping track of all things you need to keep track of, writing out the new events over to this one. And then you do what's known as a big flip. And it's a live subscription on this one. It's been, it did the entire history and now it's up to real time. Now we say, you are no longer our event store. That is now our new event store. And this one knows that, well, I should stop accepting rights at this point, and I should put in a right saying, I'm dead. And when this one receives the message that says, oh, look, he's dead, he goes, hey, I'm alive. Like, where would the, the catalyst be to do this? Like, is it really just, okay, we have... Would you rather do this with this one thing, or would you rather do it with uh, 19 million aggregate instances? With this, it's just I, I'm, I'm moving the entire store, and I understand I'm moving over lots of data that doesn't really need to be moved and blah, blah, blah. But there's one thing associated. The way the, like the versioning, like adding properties, removing properties to like anything in that data of that event, my analogy that I always give is I, I always think of like, okay, if you were using, say, any type of document store, you'd be used to doing this. If you were thinking about a relational database, and you're saying, hey, I'm going to add a new column and I don't know what to do with it. You'd make it null and backfill it. Yep. Like you're calculating, you're figuring out what to do with it. So it's just a, to me, that's my equivalent way of thinking of it. It's like just the difference here would be when you're actually processing the events, you're making that decision when you're doing that, as opposed to like, say, for example, like backfilling it. Correct. Would there be any reason to do something similar that we just talked about, but for that purpose, retrofitting events? I mean, they're not changing necessarily like the, that split, but the data like within them, you want to say, hey, I want to really backfill these things. That's, that's an absolutely reasonable thing to do. Uh, a good example of where this would happen. Um, let's imagine that we've got some data that's coming over a protocol, and over time that uh, protocol has changed. Do we want to maintain the events that are in that protocol? This is a custom serialization for protocol associated to this in the five-year-old version, or do we want to only keep those same events in the current version of it? Don't get me wrong. I love having ifs in my code. <laughs> nothing, nothing <laughs> makes it better than having ifs. And then you can be like, no, we need a factory here. Yeah. I want to thank Greg for taking the time, answering these questions, and thank you for posting these questions. Hopefully they were answered. If you have questions, you want to chat with other software developers about topics like this and event sourcing, CQRS, and just anything generally about software architecture and design, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. 
The links are in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.